Welcome to Easter Sunday at Sherwood. Amen? Amen. 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 Over the past two and a half months, we have studied the story of the Passion Week. It's that final week that leads into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have covered the events of each of the days beginning on Palm Sunday and kind of ending this morning on Easter Sunday. And I've consistently shared that the events of the Passion Week are those that are inextricably linked to God's big redemptive story that began all the way back in the Garden of Eden. If you have been here with us through the entire series, then today's message is going to be the end of a 10-week series, a 10-week journey of spiritual discovery. I've prayed that this would be a week that people would have a renewed appreciation for what happened in the Passion Week and would also give people a greater understanding of God's big plan. If you have not been with us through this entire series, then today's message is going to be a condensed version of the entire series with a special emphasis on the resurrection itself. And who knows, might even provide a little of extra incentive for people to go back and to rewatch the messages that they have missed. So we got a lot that we're gonna cover today. We got a lot that we get a chance to celebrate today. And we're going to start with a word of prayer then I'm going to move forward and reset the storyline, and then we are going to finish the week that changed the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask today that you would allow our minds to be sharp. Lord, would you remove any distraction that would keep us from hearing the clear, redemptive story that you have clearly laid out through your word? God, we need your spirit to guide us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So as best you can, I want you to try to imagine what life would have been like 2,000 years ago in Israel. According to the Jewish calendar, today would be Sunday, the 16th day of Nisan. The previous week was a week that was filled with celebration as well as major events. The celebrations included Passover as well as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Those celebrations were rated Israel's stepping out of their exodus of Egypt and out of bondage, and both of those pointed towards God's bigger redemptive plan. Those celebrations combined with God's timing, combined with fulfilled prophecy, combined with key events that happened during this week, all of those pieces came together to help tell the big story of God. The week began as Jesus arrived triumphantly into Jerusalem on Monday. He revealed himself as the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. On Monday, as each of the fathers selected their Passover lamb for their family, our Heavenly Father selected his Passover lamb for his family, that lamb being none other than Jesus himself. The lamb, once it was selected, it came into the the home for four days of inspection and connection. In a very similar way, Jesus was selected by the Father, and the next four days were days that spoke of inspection and connection. We saw how throughout the course of the week, Jesus offended three different groups of people. He offended the Roman government. He offended the religious leaders. He also offended the people of Israel. It's the reason for the fact that he enters into the shouts of people saying, Hosanna, as he comes into Jerusalem. And then at the very end of the week, we find that they are crying, crucify him at his trials on Friday. We understand that none of these events took Jesus by surprise. And for that matter, none of these events should have taken his disciples by surprise. We understand that because for three and a half years, he prepared them for what they were about to face. In fact, in this week itself, he took additional time to prepare them for the difficult moments that were going to happen at the end of the week. He prepared them by telling them of things that were going to happen before they actually happened. He preemptively told them about a traitor who was in their midst. He told them about Peter's denial. He told them about his death, about his arrest, about his beatings, about his death. He told them about his departure and about the Holy Spirit's arrival. He told them about new commandments they needed to know as well as truths that they needed to remember. And in John chapter 14, verse 29, it tells us why he told them those things. 
Jesus said to his disciples, I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. The purpose was for belief. It was for greater trust. It was so that they would have confidence in who Jesus is and what Jesus said. And every single piece had happened exactly as he told them it would, with the exception of one final piece. He said that he was going to die, and three days later, he was going to rise again. Now, this is not one of those scenarios where the disciples could go back and tell people, at least Jesus got nine out of ten predictions correct. This is a scenario that if number ten does not happen, Christianity does not exist. We understand that throughout this series, I've tried my best to share that the Jewish method of recording time is that that went from sunset to sunset, not midnight to midnight. Any amount of time that happened during that day was considered to be a full day. It could have been five minutes. It could have been five hours. It could have been 15 hours. Any amount of time between the sunsets was considered to be a full day. So how does that impact Jesus' prediction that he was going to rise again three days later? Well, you may remember that Jesus died at 3 p.m. on Friday, according to Matthew 27. That's the time that the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed in the temple, according to Exodus chapter 12. Since his death took place before sunset on Friday, then Friday is considered day one in the countdown. We understand, based on Scripture, that his body was in the tomb all of Saturday. We understand his body was in the tomb, but his spirit was very much alive. Saturday is day number two of the countdown. Now, according to that Jewish method of recording time, Sunday began right after sunset on Saturday evening. So after sunset would now start day number three. The timeline is now set. The Passover meal, as well as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, are essential components for what's about to happen. Everything that we have studied for two and a half months, every part of God's big redemptive story, it is all pointing back to this one event. If this one event does not happen, you and I are not in this room today. Christianity does not exist if this one event does not happen. What event are we talking about? The event is Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead. Easter Sunday, also referred to as Resurrection Sunday, it celebrates Jesus rising from the dead. And that one event is so important. Listen to the way the Apostle Paul described it to believers in Corinth. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. I need you to hear this. If the resurrection of Jesus is not a reality, then a reconciled relationship with God is not a possibility. This one event defines our spiritual journey. This one event changed the course of history. I want us to walk through the pieces of what's happening in this particular day because there is one major piece that happens right after sunset that is so crucial for everybody to hear. Right after sunset, Sabbath would be over. Sunday had just begun. The temple priests began a new day by cutting what was known as a sheaf. A sheaf was a bundled stack of, of grain of some kind. For the Jewish celebration that they were about to celebrate called the Day of First Fruits. The Day of First Fruits is actually the very last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Every year, just before the spring harvest, God required what was called a wave sheaf offering. This ritual dates back to God giving it to Moses back in Leviticus chapter 23. Listen to what it says in verses 10 and 11 of Leviticus 23. When you enter the land that I'm going to give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord. Listen, for you to be accepted. For you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. 
Those instructions are given in Leviticus 23, just after God's instructions for Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and just before God gives instructions for the Feast of Booths, or what's known as Pentecost. According to what is recorded in the Mishnah, now I know we don't talk a lot about the Mishnah, but the Mishnah is a collection of oral traditions that help the Jewish people understand correct procedure and practice. According to what's recorded in the Mishnah, the event would have looked something like this. Just after sunset, just after Sabbath, a messenger would go out into the fields and they would bind up some some grain into a sheaf for easy cutting. After that, the priest and his religious entourage, they would step into the fields. They would have a sickle in their hand, and they would ask the crowd the question, has the sun set? And they would say yes. Question number two, shall we reap? They would say reap. And at that, the priest would cut the standing stalks of grain. He would lift it from the ground before the people, and then he would take this sheaf, this bundle of grain, back to be prepared for the offering the next day. Overnight, the sheaf was going to be prepared. The heads of grain were separated from the sheaves. The grain was then thrashed, and it was parched, and it was ground into flour. Then the next morning, the priest would measure out a section of grain called an omer. He would lift it above the altar, and then he would bring it back down again. And listen, this is key. This is key. you got to hear this. This is key. The offering was to recognize God's provision for the upcoming harvest. Listen, it was to recognize God's provision for the upcoming harvest. In other words, apart from God, the harvest would never come. God alone was the one who enriched the soil. God alone is the one who brought the rain. God alone is the one who allowed the sun to shine. God alone is the one who infused life into the plants. God alone is the one who brings life, and God alone is the one who's going to bring the harvest. The day of first fruits represents God's provision for the upcoming harvest. Now, how does that story connect back to Easter? The gospel writers tell us that when the women and the disciples discovered the tomb, it was empty on Easter morning. It does not say Jesus rose right when they got there. It says they found that the tomb was empty. There's no question it happened on the third day. There's no question it happens on Easter Sunday. But based on the storyline of God, based on several key passages, based on God's way of connecting the festivals and the symbolism together, there is evidence to support the idea that Jesus' resurrection from the dead happened within the first few moments of Sunday or what would have been just after sunset on Saturday night for us. Now, here's the reason I would say there's evidence to support that. If you'll remember, Jesus died 3 p.m. on Friday, same time the Passover lamb was to be killed. Just after sunset on Saturday is when the priests were to cut the sheaf offering and to lift it from the ground. And remember these words, Leviticus 23, verse 11. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And then listen to this cool statement that is nestled into the Mishnah. It says, and I quote, when the priest would cut the sheaf, he would say, this is the prophesied resurrection that we have never seen in the ceremonies of the law. End of quote. As the priest lifted the sheaf from the ground, It pointed to a prophesied resurrection that they did not even have a context for in the ceremonies of the law. So let's pause there for just a moment. They lifted the sheaf representing God's provision for the future harvest. Apart from God's provision, there is no harvest that's going to come. Lifting the sheaf, it pointed to a prophesied resurrection. How does that connect back to Jesus? Listen to the way Paul explained it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. What day are they celebrating? 
They're celebrating the day of first fruits. In other words, Jesus is the only way. He's already said it. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Apart from him, there is no harvest that's ever going to come in the future. Now, I understand all of this comes back to this beautiful storyline, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but you've got to get this picture in your mind. According to Leviticus 23, the day of first fruits started a 50-day countdown to what was called the harvest. Do you know what happened exactly 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Pentecost. You know what Pentecost is called? 50. It's on the day of Pentecost that Peter gets up and he preaches in Acts chapter 2. He preaches the gospel message. And on that day, 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, the harvest has now begun. Are you getting this picture? It's on Easter Sunday when the priest cut the wave sheaf and lifted it from the ground, symbolizing a prophesied resurrection. Jesus rises from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For the next 40 days, he walks among his disciples. He walks among the people. He walks and he does things. But listen, there is no mention inside of 40 days of a bunch of people getting saved. But then he tells them just before he ascends to the Father, he says, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And for 10 days, they wait, they gather, they pray. And then, exactly 50 days after the resurrection, on the day of the harvest, Peter preaches the gospel. And 3,000 people come to faith in Christ. The wave sheaf offering is now complete. God's provision has always been Jesus. It's only by Jesus that we can come to know the Father. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. It's only by Jesus that a heart can be changed. It is only by Jesus that life can come into a dead body. It's only by him with the arrival of the Holy Spirit, the floodgates of spiritual harvest opened up and they have not been shut yet. Amen. This, it has been said, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. We cannot separate the two Testaments. It's not that one was for the past and the other is for the present. We need both the Old and the New Testament to understand the story of God. If you remove one, you have removed the foundation for the other. They're both essential. So now let's talk for just a moment on what happened around sunrise here on Easter morning. The women came to the tomb. They found it empty. All of the references are right there in your notes. Jesus has been resurrected. When they get there, the tomb is empty. Now, sometime during the night, we don't know when, but Matthew says a severe earthquake occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled away the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning in his clothing as white as snow. Now, it tells us also in this story that when that happened, it scared the guards so much they became like dead people in front of it. I'm going to say, that makes total sense to me. Put yourself in their position on that night. First, imagine you are in a graveyard at nighttime. Your job is to make sure no one steals the body that's behind this big stone. And then all of a sudden, the earth quakes that stone somehow moves itself out the way. And there is this figure that is ghostly white, bright light, sitting on top of the stone, sitting on top of the very thing that was standing between you and the dead. I guarantee you, we would be scared as well. If I were in that story, the next verse would say, and there was a preacher who went running and screaming through the graveyard. Just after sunrise, when Mary Magdalene and Mary and a couple of the other women, they showed up at the tomb, 
They brought spices to anoint the body of Jesus, and they were wondering who's going to roll away the stone. And they, they get to the tomb, and they find out that the stone is already removed. And they think someone has stolen the body of Jesus. So it tells us that Mary runs back, and she tells Peter and John. So Peter and John, they both get up, and they run towards the tomb. Apparently, John was a faster runner because he got there before Peter. He gets to the tomb. He looks in. He's like, yep, the body is gone. He doesn't walk in. He saw the linens. They were on the ground, but he doesn't go in. It says a moment later is when Peter showed up. Peter, remember Peter, he always goes the extra mile. He just goes right on into the tomb. He also sees those same linens that they are on the ground, but it also tells us he saw the face cloth of Jesus rolled up and put off by itself. Now, we understand based on the text, the text actually tells us Peter and John believed. Well, what did they believe? They believed the body was gone. But we know they didn't believe yet that Jesus had been raised from the dead. We understand that because of where the story goes after this. Now, this is where the story just gets really strange to me. It says Peter and John went home. That's it. No slapping people around for questions and answers. No, we got to get to the bottom of this. They go home. Maybe they had gone through so much disappointment in that week, they're like, my heart cannot handle anything else. I'm just going to go home. The Bible does tell us that the women stayed and they wept. Mary then stoops over. She looks into the tomb and she sees two angels one who was at the head, one who was at the feet of where the body of Jesus had been laid. One of the angels asked her why she's crying. And her response was, they've taken away my Lord and I have no idea where they've placed him. The angel's response is, why are you seeking the living one among the dead? He reminds her, of what Jesus said about being crucified and rising again. He told her that he is risen, and he also says that you are to go and tell the disciples and Peter he is going ahead of you into Galilee. He specifically mentions Peter. The last interaction between Peter and Jesus was Peter's denial. There was a really good chance that Peter would have thought that if Jesus was calling the disciples, surely he could not mean me as well. As the ladies were leaving to share the news with the disciples. They see Jesus, but they don't recognize that it's Jesus. It tells us that Mary thought he was the gardener. So Jesus asked them the same question, why are you weeping? And Mary said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him. And at that moment, Jesus said, Mary. And as soon as he called her by name, she says, Rabboni, teacher. She recognized when he called her by name. It says that the women dropped at his feet. They held on to him. They began to worship. And Jesus told Mary to go to the disciples. Tell the disciples that I must ascend to the Father and tell them I'm going ahead of you into Galilee. So Mary goes and she told the disciples everything she was instructed to tell them. But according to the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke, it says the disciples did not believe her. Now hold on just a moment. Wasn't the reason Jesus told them what was going to happen before it happened is so that they would believe Everything's happened exactly as he said it was going to happen. And it said they didn't believe. Now, all of this is taking place just after sunrise on Sunday morning. There is not another major event in the storyline until you get over to just before sunset on Sunday. John chapter 20, verse 19. It tells us the disciples were gathered together inside of a house. Doors were closed windows were closed. They were gathered together out of fear that those who put Jesus to death would also want to put them to death. They were afraid. It's just before dark. And all of a sudden, out of the middle of nowhere, Jesus appeared in their midst. 
And his first four words were, peace be with you. Now, if you've ever been standing in one location, and all of a sudden you turn and somebody's standing right next to you, and all of a sudden you get shocked, you know a little bit about what they were experiencing. But let's add in a couple more dimensions. Let's say it's almost dark. Let's say you're already afraid somebody's trying to kill you. And let's say the person who appeared next to you is the one you saw die a couple of days before. There's a reason the four, first four words were, peace be with you. They needed peace. The group is stunned at this moment. They're overwhelmed. Jesus is alive. He showed them his hands. He showed them his side. Then, listen, he rebuked them for not believing. He rebuked them for not believing what Mary had shared with them. And then he rebukes them for the hardness of their heart. At this point, I don't think they were caring a single bit about the rebuke. They were just so excited that he was there. They are excited. They're shouting. They're celebrating. And then listen, and just like that, he's gone. Doesn't tell us how long he was there. It, we just know he was there, and then he wasn't. But Thomas was not with them when that occurred. He was somewhere else. So then Thomas comes and joins the group. And the group's like, Thomas, you're never going to believe it. Jesus is alive. We saw him. He was right here. And, you know, Thomas has, he's got some, he's got some doubting issues. So Thomas very clearly said, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, listen, I'm not going to believe didn't say he couldn't. He said, I'm not going to. Listen, Jesus told them before it happened so that when it happened, they would believe. For eight days, Jesus does not reappear. We don't know what happened for eight days. There's nothing in the scriptures that tell us what he was doing for those eight days. Now, some of the disciples during that eight-day period they might have even been wondering, did we really see him? Did we make that up in our mind? Like he, he, he shows up and he's gone and we don't see him again. And then just like the last time, they're in a closed house. Doors are shut, windows are shut. And just like last time, he reappears with the same four words, peace be with you. But this time Thomas was there. This time he's in the midst. Nothing is said about what he did for eight days. Nothing is mentioned in this text about Jesus specifically addressing any of the other disciples, but he specifically addressed Thomas. He said, reach here with your finger and see my hands. Reach here with your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. That last sequence is huge. For 2,000 years, people have heard the story of Jesus. They've heard about him dying on the cross. They've heard about him being raised from the dead. And for 2,000 years, people are saying, I don't know if I can believe it or not. If you've wrestled with that before, just know the disciples who were there in that moment, they wrestled with the exact same thing. But the issue is, he told us before it happened, so that when it happened, we may believe. I have shared that same statement for three Sundays in a row because it's so important for the storyline right now. He told them before it happened, so that when it happened, they would believe. The purpose of telling in advance was so that they would have faith, that they would have trust that he is who he says he is and he will do what he said he is going to do. And yet, when the ladies came and told the disciples that Jesus had been raised from the dead, Mark 16, 11 says they refused to believe it. Not they couldn't, they refused. Luke 24, 11 says these words appeared to them as nonsense. They would not believe them. They refused to believe. They would not believe. Then right there in Thomas's story in John chapter 20, he says, I will not believe. And Jesus was so gracious to him. 
he showed him his wounds. He said, reach out and touch my hands. Put your hand in my side. Unbelievable grace. And he said, do not be unbelieving, but believing. Listen to verse 29 right after that. John 20. Jesus said, because you have seen, have you believed? Blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. In the very next two verses, it says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in the book. But these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I, I need you to hear this. The entire story of the Passion Week, every bit of the redemptive plan of God, all of the festivals, all of the celebrations, all of the symbolism, all of it was written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing we may have life in his name. If you walk out of this 10-week series, if you walk out of this room today, if you walk away from this particular broadcast and you say, that's a great story for somebody else, you did not hear the story of Jesus. He says, I've written this, that you may believe, that I may believe, and not just believe like I understand, I believe it happened, but in that believing you may have life in his name, it is to lead towards eternal life. This is all a part of this big story of God. It's a part of what began back in the Garden of Eden. Remember, I've been saying this entire thing links back to the redemptive story. Humanity is created for relationship with God. We were made to be with him and to know him. But when Adam and Eve sinned, the relationship with God was separated. They could not be in his presence the way they were designed. They could not know him the way they were intended to know him. Well, we also understand it did not mean that God did not stop loving Adam and Eve. It didn't mean that Adam and Eve hated God. It simply meant that God's holiness and sin could not abide together. Throughout the Old Testament, we find this narrative of God preparing his people for a reconciled relationship. That is, the celebrations and the festivals, they would point with yearly reminders back to the sin that separated the relationship and back to the fact that God alone would be the one to reconcile things. We would find that God would say things through prophets like Jeremiah when he said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. He would say through Hosea, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord he said through Zechariah, return to me that I may return to you. The Old Testament is the story of a relationship formed, a relationship lost, and a relationship that is pursued. God is the one all the way through the story who keeps saying, I'm going to send someone. I'm going to send a Messiah. I'm going to send one who will make things right. Jesus is that someone. He is Messiah. Through his life, his death, and his resurrection, he ushers in the kingdom of God, and he did what was necessary to make things right. Sin separated humanity in the garden, but sin is atoned for by Jesus on the cross. The relationship that was once lost in rebellion is now reconciled through relationship and resurrection. We can now experience our created purpose. We were created to know him, Sin separated that relationship. Jesus did what was necessary for reconciliation to happen. Just like the wave sheaf offering. Jesus has now been lifted up so that we are accepted. You and I could never make ourselves acceptable to God. If there were ever a potential for a future harvest, God had to be the one to do it. It's only God who has the ability to bring life out of death. It's only God who has the ability to bring beauty out of ashes. It is only God who has the ability to redeem a sinner and bring him in the right relationship with a holy God. All of that is possible 
because Jesus is risen. That is the theme of Easter Sunday. Jesus is risen. Say that with me. Jesus is risen. Say it again. Jesus is risen. All of this is leading into a theme that's happened for the entire week. Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection makes relationship possible. The entire story is pointing back to a reconciled relationship, and it tells us in the Word, I have written these things that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that in believing you may have life in his name. Have you experienced the life that can only come through Jesus Christ? Are you still in an unbelieving stage? Or do you believe? If you were to close your eyes today in death, where would you spend eternity? But let me ask another point. If God leaves you here for 50 more years, will you ever experience your created purpose to know him? We were made to know him. And until that relationship is reconciled, we exist in the shadows of what could be instead of living in the substance of our created design. I go back to how we started the series. G.K. Chesterton said, the only two things that can satisfy the soul are a person and a story. And even the story must be about a person. The ultimate person is Jesus. The ultimate story is the gospel. It is the greatest story ever told about the greatest person who ever lived. It is a story that will not only fill your mind, it is a story that will change your life. It is the story from which all other stories are derived. It is the story that has changed this world. It is the story we find ourselves in. It is the story that can change you today. Have you been changed by that story? I'm going to ask you, if you would, to bow with me for just a moment. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed for just a moment. I want as much focus as we can possibly have in the room for, for this moment. This is a, a moment that for many people, it is a moment between life and death. It is a moment in which God is either going to raise them in a new way of living or they're going to walk out of this service and they're going to continue in a life that leads towards a Christless future. So I'm going to ask you today, has the story of Jesus actually changed your life? Not was it the story that maybe you've heard many times before, but has it changed you? We're going to finish out this service, and I'm going to walk people through a very simple part of a gospel message. The gospel is very clear. The gospel is so simple. Here it is. Humanity has been created for a relationship with God. Our sin separated us from that relationship. There's nothing that you and I could ever do that would make things right. But Jesus has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. He lived a sinless life. He died a substitutionary death on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. He rose from the dead three days later that we might experience life. And he offers eternal life, a reconciled relationship to those who, who will repent of their sin by placing faith in Jesus Christ. You are not saved because you go to a church service. You are not saved because you are a morally good person. You are not saved because your name is on a church roll. You are not saved because you come from a Christian heritage. You are not saved because you admire the teachings of Jesus Christ. You are not saved because you have read the Bible a couple of times. You are not saved because you have prayed some prayers. You are not saved because you have done good deeds and given towards the poor. You are saved because of one reason, that God Almighty has made it possible for a harvest to happen. You are saved because the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed for our sin, has been atoned for our sin. He rose from the dead that you and I might experience our created purpose 
Please don't leave this room today not knowing that you are rightly related to your creator through Jesus Christ. Don't leave this room today. I'm going to lead to a very simple prayer. This prayer is between you and the Lord. If you are asking God to forgive you of your sin, if you're asking God to give you this eternal life, then this is not between you and me. It's not between you and the church right now. This is between you and the Lord. But I just want to lead you through this prayer. It would simply go like this. Just pray it in your heart to God. God, I know that I've sinned. I know my sin has separated me from you. There's nothing I could do to make things right. But the Bible says Jesus died to pay the penalty for my sin. That he rose three days later that I could experience life. God, as best I know how, I ask you, would you forgive me of my sin and give me eternal life? Would you save me? With heads still bowed, eyes still closed, I'm going to ask people to do something brave at this moment. If you have just prayed with me to receive eternal life, this is, heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed, but I'm going to ask if you would raise your hand wherever you might be around the room. Just lift it up. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hands all the way around. Thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You may put them down. In just a moment, we are going to have an invitation time. And there's going to be pastors and pastor's wives along the front. There's going to be some of our counselors, altar counselors that will be on the side. There's going to be some pastors that are even in both of our overflow rooms that are going to be standing at the front And the issue is we want to be able to connect with you. If you need prayer, if you've just placed faith in Jesus, we want to connect with you and help you see what it looks like to walk in the fullness of that new relationship with God. There's an opportunity to talk to somebody today. There might be people in this room right now that maybe you've placed faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, but just like what we saw of six people who got baptized this morning, maybe for you, the next step of obedience is baptism, and you need to do that. Come talk to one of these pastors. Talk to one of their wives. We simply want to help you live the fullness of what this relationship with God is all about. I'm going to have a word of prayer. And then we'll sing a final song of invitation. And at that time, the altar will be open. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you alone would do at this time what only you can do. God, thank you for those. Thank you for dozens of hands that went up around this room. Thank you for those who have placed faith in you as Lord and Savior. Lord, may it not just be a moment, a decision, but Lord, may they walk in the fullness of of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand at this time, there's gonna be a final song. The altar is open. Would you respond as the Spirit of God leads you?